All right, folks, I got the, I got the thumbs up, so I'm going to start. Um, flow engineering, in this case, is not about bits and computers, uh, but it is about achieving flow. It is about engineering, problem solving, targeting constraints in order to improve the flow of value to customers. So James introduced a lot of uh, great foundational material uh, first thing this morning. A lot of the books that he recommends, I recommend. They're a fantastic foundation for this stuff. And what we're really talking about when we're talking about flow engineering is solving people problems. Because people are the slowest, most expensive, problematic, challenging, and rewarding aspect of delivering flow and delivering value to customers. So um, I run a consulting company uh, called Visible that's all about value streams. When I discovered value streams, when I discovered the fact that we could sort of model flow across an organization and understand how things were happening so that customers got what they wanted, um, it kind of unlocked this way of thinking for me and seeing the organization and seeing work that has changed the way that I see product development, uh, engineering, design, everything in the organization. It kind of gave me a way to think about how things work. And I want to share a little bit about that in this presentation, but um, it's not about theory. It's about practice. This is about how do you actually solve flow problems? How do you actually see flow in the organization and then have an impact on it? So who am I? So I have started my career more than 20 years ago now in tech support. Initially, I was fixing computers. Um, I was telling people to turn things off and on and crawling under desks and plugging in cables. And it was horrible. Um, <laughs> and I moved into software. Uh, I got really interested in build and release engineering. I've sort of always gravitated to this idea of flow. Like, and understanding how things happen from a workflow perspective. So if you're curious about uh, how things work from an organizational perspective, from a people perspective, um, you're in the right room. And um, then I discovered eventually DevOps and how people were starting to talk about pipelines and delivering things with automation and making work easier and more continuous and so that was sort of a natural evolution for me. And then I got into larger and larger scales of that. So looking at larger systems, the entire organization, building uh, build automation and CICD pipelines, uh, release engineering for entire organizations. And then I started helping other organizations with that. And I would go in and assess their delivery capabilities and advise them on how to automate and improve. And that's basically brought me further and further up into this 50,000 foot view where value streams are really, really valuable. So value streams are relevant at a team scale, but they're really relevant at an organizational scale. And I'll show how. So what we're faced with these days is we have a ton of things that we have to do. Right? Our customers are very demanding. The organization's very demanding. Uh, so we build this gigantic backlog of things that need to be done and everything has to be done faster all the time. But nobody really talks about how we should do that and what's in the way, right? We're focused most of the time on the thing that's right in front of us. And oftentimes, we have systemic aspects that are impacting our ability to do that thing that's right in front of us. And it's hard to see those factors. It's hard to understand what is affecting our ability to do the thing that we want to do and to do the thing that our customers want us to do. And a lot of that is stemming from this fact that we don't have a lot of clarity on what is most important at any given moment, what we're choosing not to do by doing something, by choosing to do something. And then of all the dials and all the levers that we have access to, which ones should we pull, which ones should we turn, how much should we do any of those things, it's very difficult to understand what we should be doing and what's actually going to make an impact with a lack of clarity. And that lack of clarity, to James' point, is a side effect of complex adaptive systems. 
operating at scale, operating at a distance from an outcome, meaning that you're upstream of something that's going to happen far downstream, maybe weeks or months in the future, the thing that you're working on, if you're writing a line of code, it might be weeks until a customer is actually using that. It might be weeks until you find out that there was a bug introduced or there was a vulnerability that is causing problems now. So how do you understand this entire stretch from upstream to downstream and what to do about it? So clarity is kind of a really important factor here, and it's really hard. Because even on a single team, let's say you have eight people, they have eight unique perspectives, right? Everyone is going to be either focused on their own piece of the puzzle or come with their own perspective that means that they are focused in a different place than your focus, right? They have different points of view. And a model that I like to think about for this is standing at an intersection. You can be at the same intersection with someone, but on a separate street corner. And so your perspective is entirely different. You're looking at different things. You notice different things. And that makes it hard to work together. And we have to work together and we have to coordinate in order to be effective because we can't do anything in isolation. Right? Part of complex adaptive systems means there's lots of nodes interacting in emergent ways. And so we have multiple people and we don't have really easy ways of modeling what happens when you have all these people interacting with each other. You know, we have Dunbar's number, we have this like representation of all these interconnected nodes. But what does that actually give us, right? Is it going to tell us what to focus on next or what is going to be the ROI of a specific effort? No, it's just going to tell us like don't let your teams get too big, right? Or you need to have people like coordinating on a regular basis. It's not super practical actionable advice. It's just sort of like what to think about. So uh, this is all made very difficult because you cannot copy and paste any specific action from any other organization, right? Everybody tried for the last five years to copy and paste Spotify's model and completely failed because they're not Spotify, right? And you can't copy Amazon because you're not Amazon. You can't copy anyone because you have a unique local context to your work. And so you have to sort of develop tools and strategies that can give you actionable principles and techniques that work in your context, that sort of were generated natively in your environment. Right? If you take someone who was born and raised in one part of the world and just drop them in another part of the world, they're going to have a really hard time. But if they were to build skills and capabilities, if they had access to compasses and maps, and simple models, they can navigate that new environment. And that's sort of what flow engineering is all about, is providing you simple tools and models so that you can navigate if you're in a completely different environment than another organization. Or if you go into another team, you can navigate because you'll have tools. So what I use to generate this clarity and create a model of an organization is collaborative mapping. And that's what I'm going to be talking to folks about. Is this idea that you can model out a representation of your local environment that is custom to you, that has all of your context, that allows you to make decisions that are going to be unique to your individual needs and the needs of your specific constraints or capabilities. So what I use for this is collaborative mapping. I've been doing this almost exclusively through COVID. So this is all sort of entirely remote friendly. And I did a lot of this um, with Zoom and a whiteboard. Uh, you can use anything for this. I've, I've used uh, literal pieces of paper, uh, post-it notes on a wall. I've used Google Slides. I've used uh, Google Sheets. You can use anything for this. It's, it doesn't matter what tools you have. What matters is the models that you're, you're using and the techniques that you're using. And I'm going to show you a few of my favorites. So what you get out of this practice is you get highly engaged people because they're asked to contribute their individual perspectives and come to these exercises as themselves and bring their own perspectives and 
combine them with everyone else's. And so they're able to bring themselves to this effort. They're able to share their contributions to this, which means they own part of the outcome. Um, has anyone ever heard of the IKEA effect? It's essentially I'm one country off from maybe where that would be most relevant, but the IKEA effect essentially means that like when you build something, when you take a dresser and it's like a stack of wood and then you build it into something real, you kind of own part of that outcome, right? And you feel better about owning that thing because you didn't just buy it off a shelf and have it dropped in your house. You went through the effort of building it yourself. So you feel a little bit more attached to the outcome. You feel like you were part of building that thing. And you get the same thing from collaborative mapping. You get this outcome where the participants feel like they were part of generating the result. And so they feel a lot more comfortable about using it and having it represent their contribution. Whereas if you just drop something into a team and say, hey, we're doing this, chances are you're going to get a lot of people say, well, mm, like, let me start pointing out problems with this. And you, know, you won't be done for six days. When people generate the outcome, they're part of building it. And at any moment, they can say, mm, you know what? This is kind of moving in a direction that I wasn't expecting. What about this, right? You have course correction abilities. And when you're done, people can say, yeah, like this looks great. Because they were participating the entire time. So you also, as a part of this, get a bunch of alignment. You get alignment that you wouldn't get elsewhere. You don't get alignment by saying, here's what we're doing. You get alignment by everybody contributing and saying, this makes sense. You know, where we arrived at makes sense to us. We all arrived there together, so we're all on the same page. And we can now head off in a direction together, rather than having the ivory tower send something down or something copy and pasted and have people sort of have to reconcile with that. So the other great aspect of this is that every outcome is entirely customized to the context. I've never made two identical maps with teams. Even inside of an organization, even inside of a team, from one week to the next, you will get a map that matches the territory as it is, right? You're not copying maps from organization to organization. You can copy the technique, but the map is going to be highly localized, highly customized to the context. And that means all of this together, everybody participating in the mapping sessions means that they remember what comes out of it, right? It sticks in their head because they were part of building it and the whole time they were sort of iteratively adding on detail and extra information and context, that means by the time they come to the end of it, they have a map that represents their learning, that they can go and action, but it wasn't just created out of thin air. It was sort of built in their mind as it was being built out virtually. And again, so this is entirely remote friendly. So going into the future, we might be back in offices, but chances are we're always going to have somebody who's like out in the middle of the wilderness or like on a beach somewhere. And we can bring them into this process. We can make sure that this is sort of like future proof because it is extremely remote friendly. The other thing is that it gets easily captured. You know, you can capture all the voting on things. You can capture all the commenting. You can capture all kinds of contextual information that you couldn't get from post-it notes on a wall. Uh, so how do we start doing this, right? As I mentioned, this is an inclusive process. It's a process of bringing separate perspectives together. So we want representation from all parts of the organization that are involved in a specific value stream. So if you're thinking of value streams, okay, what is that? What is a value stream? A value stream is essentially a process with a customer where you have a clearly represented flow of work that results in value to somebody at the end. And the part that makes it a value stream is that it's generating value the entire time. It's, it's building out something that gets delivered at the end. A process can be entirely automated. 
A value stream is made of people and their work. And I'll show you what I mean by that. But before we get to value stream mapping, the most important thing to start with is understanding the direction, understanding the destination, and working backwards. So what I use for that is something I call outcome mapping. It's kind of informed by a bunch of different techniques. But it's essentially picking a target and then working backwards to understand it so that everybody has clarity and alignment from the very beginning. So when we start this process of flow engineering, we're picking a target. We want to uh, reduce the number of production defects that we're generating. For example. Or you know, we want to hit a specific NPS number with our customers. Or we want to triple the number of features that we deliver to customers this year. It could be anything. You could pick anything. And part of this process is kind of generating that from scratch. We could do discovery sessions to find out what is the best outcome that we could pursue. Sometimes it's unclear. I mean, that eight people, eight perspectives means that eight people probably have different ideas about what we should be doing and what's the most important thing to do. So before we even start this, we might actually do some discovery to figure out, of all the things that we could do, what is the most valuable thing? What can we all agree is the most important thing that we should pursue? So let's take this team, this fictional team. They want to go twice as fast. And so the outcome is about defining what is it that we want? What do we want to focus on? Because the more we can focus, the more successful and productive we're going to be. You could qualify this further if you wanted. You could say, we want to go twice as fast, but we don't want quality to decrease. So you could keep that as a, you know, another post-it that just clarifies, you know, we want to do this, we also don't want to do that. That's totally fine. But as the clearer, the better, obviously. The next thing that we do with this is we figure out why is this important? Because chances are eight people, eight perspectives means we're not on the same page about why this is important. Some people want it so that they get their bonus at the end of the year. Some people might be really passionate about what happens when they ship things twice as fast. They learn faster, or they're making customers happy, and that's really meaningful to them. Or they're delivering on a mission that is very long-term. Some people are short-term, some people are long-term. Those same people could be different perspectives at different times, right? We all have different time horizons. We all have different scales that we're thinking of. And all of that needs to come together if we're going to come together, right? So the whys are really, how do we talk about why this is valuable to us? Why is it valuable to customers? Why is it valuable to the organization? Right? There's three lenses. Why is it valued to individuals, the organization, and to customers? Because for some people, one of those things matters way more than the others. And that's fine. We just want it out so that we can talk about it and that we all get on the same page. Because if we start from some origin where we're not even in the same place, and then we head off in separate directions, our odds of success go way down. So this is all about starting from the same place and heading off in the same direction. So then we look at obstacles. And I think obstacles are really valuable for thinking about what could go wrong, right? It's a way to kind of test our understanding of a given outcome and, and where we are in relation to that outcome. But it also gives people a chance to surface concerns, right? There's always, out of those eight people with eight perspectives, there's probably a couple people who are like, mm, like, this is not going to work just like everything else hasn't worked for the past five years, right? How many people do we work with like that who are just like, I'd rather not do anything because everything we try to do fails. So we're like, I can see a million reasons why this is going to go wrong. You have those people in your organization. You have to work with those people. Those people can add value if you give them opportunities to contribute value. And the value that they contribute might be just surfacing obstacles. They could just be the people who are like, this could go wrong, this could go wrong, this could go wrong. That's great. Understanding risk is important. Giving people a voice and giving people an opportunity to contribute is important if we all want to be on the same team and, and working together. So obstacles is really about what are the things that we need to understand or mitigate so that we can actually pursue this outcome as effectively as possible. And then investigations is about how do we understand more about 
our outcome and getting to our outcome. Maybe that's going around obstacles. Maybe it's breaking them down. Maybe it's maybe we can find uh, a better route that avoids the obstacles altogether. Or maybe this isn't the right outcome. Maybe we need to like find out more about what we're trying to do so that we can get there more effectively. So outcomes is all about um, taking a target and understanding it to a degree where everybody on the on the team becomes very clear on what it's going to take to get there, at least to start, so that we start from the same place and we start in the same direction. So first starts with exploration. We can take a bunch of things. We can take questions, ideas, context, collect it all together, correlate it, understand it. We can vote on things if we're, if we're undecided. You know, if we, have, if we come down to three different outcomes and nobody can decide, we can vote. We can get ourselves on the same page. Then we understand whys, then we understand obstacles, we understand investigations. We can also go beyond that. You can go into measures or methods. You can connect any nodes that you want to something like this because it's a generative map, it's a generative process. You can add as much context as you want. You will hit diminishing returns. Eventually you have to start doing things, you have to stop mapping and start doing, but clarity is, important before you start working. So you want to be in a place where you feel good about being on the same page, starting in the same direction. That brings me to value stream mapping because value stream mapping is the representation of how we're going to get to that outcome. It's the mechanism that's delivering work today that needs to be improved so that we get to our outcome in the future. So if we want to uh, deliver twice as fast, that brings us to a release process value stream, right? It's a, maybe it's multiple products that come together for a quarterly release. And so we might actually be looking at a value stream that's segmented or separated into four or five individual value streams. We can use the same mechanism and method to map all of them and to understand them so that we understand what's going to contribute to our outcome. So when we're talking about value stream mapping, the simplest explanation of value stream mapping is you have a series of activities that are linear. And if they're not linear, uh, they don't have to be linear. In a lot of cases, you know, you have branching, you have multiple things happening in parallel. That's just uh, complexity that's valuable to recognize and ignore. You can have a value stream app where it just looks like a total mess, and chances are your workflow looks like a total mess. So it's good to actually represent how messy it is because then you can start to clean it up. So a lot of cases I talk to folks and they're like, oh, yeah, you know, our workflow isn't this like streamlined thing. It goes all over the place. And that's kind of a great starting point because obviously, you know, if it's messy, you want to clean it up. If it's complicated, you want to simplify it. Um, and representing it is kind of the first step to getting there. The more we can be on the same page about what things actually look like, the more we can be on the same page about what to do about it. So we set out these activities that happen sequentially, and then we start measuring how long everything takes. So this is valuable because it gives us a mechanism to compare distinct activities in the flow and to start to target our efforts in specific places. Otherwise, everything is the same, right? And if everything is the same, we can't prioritize, we can't focus. So step timing is the first thing that we rep represent on the value stream. And then we look at delay timing. So how long does everything wait in between stages? And that can start to highlight where things are taking the most time. So in this representation of a value stream, we can see that this section in the middle around environment setup is taking way longer than everything else. So for everyone who is thinking, yeah, you know, we need to build out deployment automation, or you know, it takes us too long to, to plan sprints or whatever it is, all of a sudden everybody now knows, forget about all that other stuff. Environment setup is the thing that's holding us back more than anything else. So we can all swarm on that, or we can at least understand that that's going to take dedicated effort, that's going to take focus, that's going to pay off. And all those other things might not 
make much of a difference. So if we're trying to go twice as fast, if we spend all of our time on deployment automation, and I've worked with a number of companies where they come to me and they're like, we need to automate X, Y, or Z. And the question is like, okay, based on what? And it's like, well, everybody good automates these things, right? All the best teams have full automation. And then what happens is we map the value stream and, and find out, wait, wait a second, like we could automate your entire release process. This planning stage up front takes eight weeks and you're saving like five minutes by automating this thing downstream. And so by mapping out the value stream, you have this conversation about what's really slowing everybody down. And it's often not what you think, or it's not what everybody thinks, right? Eight people, eight perspectives means there might be two people on the team who've been dying to tell everybody, if we just fix this one thing, everything else will get better, but they don't have a way of communicating that. We don't have a way of, of communicating that together as a team. And a value stream app gives us an opportunity to have a really good conversation about where we should focus and what that impact will be. The other aspect of this is that once you have data, you can start to simulate. You can start to say, okay, well, if we were to trim this down by 80%, here's what that would mean in terms of the ultimate outcome. You know, we can estimate that if we put a week of effort into automating this piece, that we're going to improve by 30%. And that is a conversation that you can't have unless you have data to point to. Value stream map gives you a visual that's very easy to communicate with, and then data to allow you to make a case or prioritize and understand what the tangible benefit of, of your efforts is going to be. So often these start to look like something like this, where you have multiple different dimensions represented. So we have timing here, but we also have roles represented in the value stream. So we want to understand who's doing what and how things actually happen. You have things like rework here, so you can see where work is being sent back and the probability of that or how often that happens. You can also represent things like um, quality. So we use co percent complete and accurate to, to represent how often things move through the value stream and hit specifications or hit our expectations. You can represent value added time, which is like how much time do we spend actually doing valuable things versus setting up machines or tearing things down or resetting things or getting data from one place and putting it in another place. A value stream app gives us the ability to represent all that data in different domains. You can add as many layers as you want. You can represent anything. And again, just like outcome mapping or any mapping, there's diminishing returns. As you add information, you might be making the map more convoluted or more complicated. So you can make a judgment call about, given your target outcome, what is the detail that's going to help you make your decisions? So with value stream mapping, what we do is we start by selecting a stream. And oftentimes in organizations, nobody has said, these are our streams, right? We're, we're in early days of organizations Everybody who talks to me is like, how do I even find my value stream? They're there. They're a logical construct. You can, you can define them however you want. You can define the boundaries however you want. Really, what defines a value stream is the idea of concept to cash, or um, that what James said, basically, an idea to thank you, right? There's a flow. The broader that spectrum, where you draw the, the goalposts, is going to uh, dictate how much detail, how much activity you're capturing, and what is represented in the map. And you want to make it large enough that you're capturing all the constraints that matter, the things that are actually slowing you down. If you make your value stream map from this is when someone starts writing code to when they close their pull request, you're going to be missing all the planning and all the architectural process upstream that might be slowing you down way more than anything that's happening in the developer workflow. Right? So drawing the boundaries constructively and capturing what's really happening in the overall end-to-end -end flow is where you get most of your benefit. Right? You want to make sure that you have enough of the map that you capture the, the detail. So let's say you, know, you draw a map of your territory. Let's say you're a small village. 
And someone says, you know, we have to make sure that we defend our borders and we're building the right fortifications to make the town safe. And so someone goes out and they start drawing a map and they've got like a stream over here. And okay, that's, that's a good strategic asset that we should, be, we should be working with. And they've got a hill on one side and they draw their map boundaries and they're drawing, you know, five kilometers out from the town center. And it turns out that there's like a giant clan of Vikings six kilometers out and nobody's captured any of that in the map, right? All of a sudden, all the decisions that you've made about fortifications, about your you know, defense strategy are useless because you didn't capture enough of the map to make the right decisions. So again, you could also draw an enormous map. You could draw the entire world just to make decisions about your tiny town, and that would take you too long, right? Maybe that person would never come back because they'd hit the, you know, the Viking clan and get wiped out. But so the key is to draw the right boundaries to understand that you're capturing the most useful data to make your decisions. Then what we do once we've decided, okay, let's look at the release process, or let's look at this specific product within the release process, and then we'll aggregate all of our understanding and look at the release process as a whole. But you build it out with each activity in the flow. You add timing, other dimensions, and then you're able to target hotspots. You're able to identify constraints in the flow. And that can help you focus, get everybody in the team focused on the thing that's gonna make the biggest difference. And the difference between this and just business as usual is that there's tons of waste in what you're doing right now. There's tons of waste in what we're all doing all the time. We just don't see it and we don't have a way of measuring it. And that means that you know over time we slow down and everything gets painful and eventually we hate going to work because we don't have ways of identifying the things that are gonna make the biggest difference. So this is a technique to represent all of that so that as a team we can start to you know, clean things up before they become problems or continuously improve by identifying the right most valuable opportunities. Most of the time when we map, we're finding 20% of the entire value stream is just waste that we could just get rid of overnight. So you go from status quo to 20% improvement the next day. And the way that you do that is you draw out one of these value streams and then everyone says like, I had no idea that that was happening and we can stop tomorrow. And it's usually something like a meeting that nobody cares about or there's some handoff or we go and we have a meeting with someone to get approval for something and all they would want is like, as long as you check these three boxes, like you don't have to talk to me. Or there's a meeting that could happen over Slack or there's something, there's something in the value stream or some collection of things that are easy to do they give you a 20% improvement overnight. And this is not just my experience. Um, you know, sometimes it's 60% of the value stream overnight. But everybody I've talked to who does value stream mapping, most people say 20% overnight, which pays for the effort more than five times. It takes two to three hours to map one of these value streams. So given the return on investment, it's pretty massive. And it's, it's not as challenging as you think. So dependency mapping then is digging into the hotspots to understand why they're a problem. And what that looks like is, if we're looking at our environment management stage, we can dig into that and, and understand, okay, well, this is slow because we have to go talk to the data team, we have to go talk to the DevOps team, and they have to do their things, and they have SLAs, and what they're really doing is these specific activities. We could sort of dig and try to understand, okay, well, what's actually happening here? And why does it take so long? And we can understand what's inside that constraint so that we can start to break it apart. We can start to address it by understanding it. But oftentimes we don't have a model for understanding these things or, or having good conversations uh, with folks about them. But if we can represent things that, this way, we can go to the data team, we can go to the DevOps team and say, this is our understanding of what's happening. What can you tell us about how we can address this? What, what can we do to make this a little bit better? 
And you can start to have really good conversations about, well, if we just did this instead of this, or, you know, you guys could do this. All it takes is, you know, this, these three commands and we can put them into Slack for you and you can just type this or whatever it is. You just like send a message to this person instead of putting in a ticket and having it sit for eight hours because this is not a big problem. So you could tackle it yourself. There's a million different ways that we can solve these problems. The thing that holds us back is that we don't have these conversations. We don't have constructive conversations. We don't have conversations that are based on data. And so a bunch of opinions float around and opinions bring us nowhere, right? Data brings us constructive conversations. Data brings us onto the same page and within a common understanding. And a visual representation is even better than data. So what do we do with dependencies? We understand the value stream in terms of dependencies. We focus on the constraints, the things, the hotspots, the things that are slowing us down. Then we map them out. We understand, okay, well, what is that? What's behind that constraint? What is the thing that's behind what's slowing us down? We understand, like, how long does this activity take? Is there an SLA that's involved? Because if you have an SLA, chances are it's going to take the maximum amount of time involved in that SLA every single time. If I have 10 days to do something, I'm going to take 10 days. Like, I should. Otherwise, you know, I'm not going to get my work done. There's things that I have to do. Um, so SLAs are huge and being able to represent SLAs in terms of a value stream, in terms of flow, in terms of the impact on customers and our, our target outcome is huge. Now we can have conversations about the impact of SLAs and what it means to have a 10 day SLA. You can understand, okay, a 10 day SLA means if we were to wait 10 days, that's 32% of the entire time that it takes us to, to ship our software. So is that a reasonable SLA under those conditions? And you can have that conversation by saying, here's the value stream, the whole thing from start to finish, 22 days. And then we have an SLA for 10 days in the middle. Does that make sense? Does it make sense for half of the entire process to be held up by one thing where it's, you know, it's essentially somebody flipping, flipping a bit somewhere. Then, so just like with value stream mapping, we can highlight hotspots. We can call out, this is the most painful dependency, this is the one that's impacting us the most. And then you can do all kinds of things to sort of visually represent how those dependencies are affecting the organization. That's going to bring me to capability mapping, which is how you address dependencies. So if you want to actually get rid of dependencies, you have to internalize those capabilities, right? If you have a team that's doing something for you, if you can do that thing, all of a sudden you don't have to go out to the team to do it. And that doesn't mean I have to learn everything about data architecture so that I don't have to go to the data team. It could mean that they just provide you with something, some interface that allows you to do something that they would ordinarily do, that they would probably rather not do, right? If you can do it yourself, they probably don't want to do it, right? So. If we talk about capabilities behind the dependencies, all of a sudden we have a mechanism to localize that, to bring it into the team. We can start to have conversations about what if we just, um, you know, what if we filled out this checklist before we sent you a request? Oh yeah, if we had the checklist, it'd be two seconds. But without having the checklist, we have to go and look. And then we have to go ask this person. So there's all kinds of things that we can do to mitigate the impact of these dependencies. And capabilities are how we sort of understand what's actually provided by the dependencies so that we can start to break them down, start to internalize them. So if we look at the capabilities behind the dependencies in this case, we have data refresh, data cloning, so cloning a database or creating a fresh instance of data, all these things that could be sat behind an API or a Slack command or or something, some kind of um, tooling and automation that could per perhaps address those. But let's understand more about them first. So inside the team, let's say, we have a team of eight people. We're building a product as part of this release uh, process. Who owns data refresh? Who could own data refresh in the team? Turns out nobody, 
we don't have any we don't have anybody who would you know own that naturally so that's a gap right uh, but you know if we're talking about standing up and tearing down environments Candace has done that in the past she knows how to do it she could own that uh, who's a backup for those people right in most cases like how many people have uh, defined capabilities in their team. We got this. Is this is this is more than I expected? Um, but chances are, even if you have defined capabilities, right? Even if your team has said these are the important things that we need to do, chances are they might have an owner. But I would bet my life savings that they do not have a backup. They don't have somebody who says like, "Oh yeah, you know, Phil's away. I fill in for Phil." I know everything Phil does and we can get it done. But capability mapping allows us to be specific, explicit about those things and say, yes, if Candace is away, Derek will fill in for Candace. And then all of a sudden we understand, okay, well, here's how that's actually gonna happen. Here's how we're going to address our dependencies. Here's how we're going to actually tackle our constraints. And so we can understand things like skill, like where are we with this thing? We actually able to take this on, you know. If we were to assign an owner and a backup for this, what's our skill level? How competent are we at doing this thing? And what kind of resources do we have? Meaning, what kind of training is available to people? What documentation do we have? APIs where we can do this? Is there some tool like an open source tool that we could just adopt that will allow us to do this? And that all brings us to an overall score where we can represent. Here's where we are with that thing, and and. So you can understand, okay, well, here's what it would take for us to break that dependency, to, to internalize that capability and speed up the entire process in a way that was automated and continuous so that we can level up and focus on the next important thing. Because what you want to do is build this continuous flow that allows you to then improve and build more and more automation, more and more capability so that over time, you're advancing the organization, you're getting better outcomes with lower investment, and the whole thing sort of builds over time naturally, just like, you know, just like a city that's functioning properly. You know, it can scale, it can adapt, um, because it's covered the basics, and it's sort of automated everything like transit signals, and um, roads, and water, and electricity, and things. It allows you to do advanced operations, like close down a street for pedestrian access and have a festival. Um, so what do we do when we're mapping dependencies? And what do we get out of this process? We're able to understand something like setting up an environment and identify each of the activities and where those activities this is like zooming into a value stream. We can zoom out, we can zoom in, you can represent flow at any level. You can have a 50,000 foot view of flow, but you could also have a 10 foot view of flow and understand inside of one activity, what is the flow inside that one activity? If you wanna get granular, and you can get granular if you take everything that you could possibly focus on and narrow that scope to the hotspots, right? The things that are taking the most time. You don't want to understand everything about everything because you'd never get any work done. But understanding more about the hotspots, the places where things are really bad, means that we can make good decisions about what to do about them. So in this case, we can do things like refresh the data only when we need to, right? That's a pretty simple representation. Let's figure out what dictates when we need to refresh the data and only refresh the data when we need to. We can look at things like when do we have to uh, manually test everything? What is the criteria, right? That's a simple checklist. Building these things doesn't take a lot of effort, right? Figuring out when should we actually test end-to-end? -end? When should we refresh the data? Instead of saying 100% of the time we do it or 0% of the time we do it, or we do it when we feel like it might be valuable, we can define these things and then give them to someone and make sure that they get done. Or even better, give them to a system and make sure that they happen automatically. So then we can change how we're doing these things and then introduce a cumulative benefit that then factors back up to the value. By diving into this dependency and tackling what's happening inside of this constraint, you then 
recognize a benefit to the overall value stream. Right? We're, in, we're improving our time to, uh, to deliver this process, the results to customers. And this is 35% of the total time. So we've almost hit our target just by tackling one tiny piece of the value stream. So we're going from this interrupt-driven environment where things happen you know, as, as they arise and we tackle things like firefighters to a point where we can involve capabilities and involve flow uh, over time and get faster and get better and, and benefit from things like economies of scale rather than be hindered by them. So this is a pretty familiar construct to folks. Obviously, this is uh, building on top of what James said this morning. But, you know, inside of this, we have multiple different structures, right? We have a structure of authority. We have that sort of like top down. Uh, we have things like silos that are represented. Again, very vertical. But when we're talking about flow, we're talking about value stream. So James actually took a value stream and sort of like inverted it. But I don't actually agree with that model because... A value stream doesn't start with the CEO and go all the way down to like, you know, the, whoever the most junior person in the organization. It's a way to represent it, but essentially a value stream runs horizontal. It, it's, it's, it's more across the organization than it is up and down because it involves a team made up of people like UX designers and architects and engineers and QA people. They're usually a slice across multiple silos. You know, they live in sort of, their designer lives in the design silo. They report to a design manager, a functional manager, right? And so the value stream sort of brings these people together from a horizontal slice. And we also, you know, if you're talking about Spotify, you have things like communities of practice, like guilds. They're another horizontal slice across the organization. They're this, they're flow-based. They're, they're talking about bringing people together to deliver some outcome. And usually those people are across the organization. So we want to be aware of these structures of flow so that um, we can start modeling and thinking in terms of what's actually going to deliver the outcome. It's not a vertical silo. It's not authority in the organization. It's this flow. It's this collection of people and activities that happen to deliver value. So um, what we're aiming for here is a couple of different things. So collective flow is that, that value stream, right? That representation of all the things that are happening to get things out to customers. And that's collective. That's a bunch of different people working together. And what we want to do is things like minimize delays, minimize friction, minimize waste. We also want personal flow, right? As individuals and as a organization of individual contributors, we want to maximize the amount of time that they spend in flow. And so personal flow, this is a, you know, a famous book um, from, I'm going to butcher it, but I try every time, Mihai, Csikszentmihalyi, um, created a, flow, uh, a book about personal flow, about what it takes to get in the zone, essentially, where we're working and it feels like everything is moving in the right direction. You have that sense of progress. You have that sense of challenge and achievement that things are going in the right direction and you just sort of like sink into the work. In order to do that, you need collective flow, right? You can't just go off and work on your own and achieve flow uh, because, you know, what you want to be working on is something meaningful. And oftentimes, if we don't have collective flow, it means that we're constantly being interrupted or, you know, we're inside of a process that is full of friction and waste we're not going to hit that flow state, right? Um, so we have to have these things sort of work together. And in the personal flow sense, what we want is to maximize engagement. You want to be able to sink into your work. And you want to be focused on things that are really important, that are actually making a difference. That means we don't want to be working on toil. We don't want to be working on things that aren't moving the needle, which means we have to tackle bottlenecks. We have to tackle the hot spots in flow. Uh, in order to keep people in the zone as much as possible and allow them to focus on the most creative, the most human, the most valuable things that they can, they can be bringing to the overall organization. 
So what, what happens most of the time, though, is this like interrupt-driven workflow where you know, we either have like a reaction to things that are coming up or fighting fires. We either can't do things, we've got to get together with people in order to do things, we can't do things on our own. Uh, we've got all these handoffs to deal with. We have miscommunication. We have finger pointing, sick days that we have to deal with. There's a million things that get in our way on a regular basis. And it's because we don't have these engineered mechanisms of flow. We don't spend time building value streams and understanding value streams so that we can create end-to-end -end flow that allows us to be in personal flow in a sense of constant progress and achievement. So what happens with um, how this actually evolves? You heard about team topologies earlier today. In a lot of organizations, they have things like complicated subsystems, teams without knowing it, right? They have things like shared services. And what happens with shared services is that you have people that are like constantly shoulder tapped or they're just, you just fire tickets in for everything. They're constantly being interrupted. And we're moving into models um, where we're building out these services as products. The platform team is essentially a shared service as a product. And it has its own value stream. So in this representation, we have a streamlined team, like a product team. We also have a platform team. They both operate as value streams. They both have customers, they both have flow, they both have a sequence of activities that they're, they're developing. And when you're developing a, pro a platform, you're essentially, it's an internal product, right? And a lot of um, cases, you know, in, in, in Amazon's case, you're developing an internal product that's probably gonna be sold externally because they do such a good job of building out internal products for customers by default. Um, and so essentially, you know, all the services, if you fire up AWS, each one of those products is like a platform that then gets published as a, as a product to customers. But there's, th there's not a point where they sort of like flip the switch and say, hey, now we're gonna be like a product team. They're a product team from the very beginning. A platform team is a product team. This is one thing I, like, I've talked to Manuel and, and Matthew about um, back and forth. Because I think every, uh, every uh, team that's producing in the organization, whether it's platforms or products, are, they're just product teams. They, they have different customers. But the product and the approach is the same. So we're moving to things like platform teams that support these capabilities, that provide a high user experience, a valuable user experience to people who are consuming these products and platforms. And um, there's a lot of different ways that we can represent this in mapping. So you have team topologies, you can sort of look at how is our organization defined right now? How do we want it to be defined? Um, but another thing that you can do is something like Wardley mapping. How many people have heard of Wardley mapping? Awesome, okay, that's great. Wardley mapping is, uh, it's a fancy way of representing an organization in terms of dependencies. And in terms of, it's essentially a value chain diagram, which is different than a value stream diagram, but it's, it's representing what are all the components, oh wow, this really washed out all the connections here, so you can't actually see. There are very faint lines that connect all those things together. But essentially what we're saying with a Wardley map is, in order to de de deliver value to customers, um, a bunch of things need to be connected. And a bunch of things need to be delivered to them. And they all depend on different things. So over here in the cloud services, cloud services are something that you probably shouldn't be doing yourself. You should be purchasing that from a cloud provider because we're, you're probably not in the, in the business of, of providing cloud products. That's like things like electricity um, live in that, that bottom right corner. And then, you know, things like um, an app, like a brand new, uh, let's say, highly sophisticated app that your customers interact with goes in the top left. And a lot of organizations, they're in this business of having like shared services 
where they have like an IT team or a DevOps team that essentially just takes tickets from people and if they're lucky, or they just get constantly interrupted. And they're, everything that they're doing is just custom built. They're just constantly reacting to things. They're not actually building a platform that allows people to solve their own problems or, or take their own, um, use, use, solve their own problems. So what we want to do is take something like a shared services team and move it to a platform team, become a platform team, provide capabilities to the organization that they can consume on their own so that they can constantly focus on developing a better platform. You can't build a better product, you can't build a better service for your organization if you're constantly interrupted, if you're constantly tapped on the shoulder. So we can represent these things with collaborative mapping. We can have really good conversations about, okay, what's it gonna take to get there? What are the capabilities behind that? Where are we right now? Uh, what's between us and that? Um, and I've seen, super excellent conversations happen in organizations as a result of these collaborative mapping sessions because everybody is now having a conversation about something they couldn't talk about productively before because it was just opinion versus opinion and trying to describe things that would be interpreted completely differently depending on who was listening. So the other thing that I like is uh, what I call flow roadmap, which is a roadmap, a basic roadmap uh, that talks about how things are going to happen. How are we actually going to ship the, the roadmap roadmap? A lot of people have a roadmap. Uh, if you're on a product team, you probably have a roadmap. But nobody has a roadmap for like, how is any of this stuff actually going to happen? How are we going to hit all these milestones? By what method are we going to deliver anything in this giant backlog of crap that we have to do? Uh, because nobody's built a flow roadmap. Nobody's built a, a roadmap that says, Here's how we're going to support our delivery of everything that we need to do. So we have things like milestones and actions, uh, measures of progress. I like to understand how are we actually going to know that we're headed in the right direction. And then the other piece, who's going to own it? I think the difference between getting things done and not getting things done often comes down to the fact that nobody owns something. And if nobody owns something, it's not going to, it's not going to happen. So I like to represent things like ownership on a, on a roadmap. But we can take things like automated testing and paying down technical debt or whatever it is. You can represent anything on here. But this is kind of like where you transform all the insights that you collect with all the other mapping into action, all the things that we're going to do because we learn things while we're mapping, right? While you're mapping, you understand, okay, well, we need to build out automated data refreshing capabilities, right? We need a commit an API that's going to allow us to refresh data. So who's going to do that? When's it going to get done? How are we going to measure it? So you can represent anything on this, um, but it takes all your learning and translates it into an actionable plan that you can put in front of leadership or executives or other teams and say, like, here's what we're going to do, uh, which is really valuable because after you map, you go back to your job, and most of the time when you leave a workshop or you leave something, you go back and it's like it never happened, right? But this creates something, some artifact that everyone can follow and point to and, and move forward. So what happens when we do this? So these are some basic uh, typical outcomes, prototypical outcomes. I've saved companies $20 million after mapping for three hours uh, because they were headed in the complete wrong direction and they were going to spend a ton of money in 18 months on doing the wrong thing, but we figured out what the right thing to do was through, through mapping a value stream. But you, know, you can increase your capacity, you can increase your capabilities, you can increase your performance by highlighting what's slowing you down and what it's going to take to speed up or improve your outcomes or improve your performance. And that can be quality, it can be speed, it can be um, uh, really anything. It could be faster speed uh, delivery, but it can also be delivering more as well. So flow engineering is really about this flow from picking a clear target, understanding the proper target to focus on, Understanding the landscape, like understanding where you are and what's actually happening, 
And then understanding what's between you and your target outcome. And you use maps to actually create that clarity, right? To understand what it's going to take to go from friction to flow and waste into capacity or capability. So if you're interested in that, uh, I have a, a book called um, Flow Engineering that's available for free on a website uh, at flow.visible.is. I also started a, a video podcast with uh, my co-author. We're writing a book on this for IT Revolution, the same folks who published Team Topologies and a bunch of other books that you might know. Um, so that's a value stream show. We have uh, like one episode up right now, but we're working on it. And uh, I would love to talk to anybody about, you know, friction, challenges they're seeing, um, goals that they have, confusion around all of this. Um, I would be happy to, to talk to anybody. Um, now or otherwise, you can find me on the internet in many different places. Um, but the best one is probably visible. Thanks very much.